So let's give a nice warm welcome for Scott. Come on up. All right. Our post lunch speaker. Scott, give you something up. All right. How's everybody doing? Good? Yes. So I'm with Pulse Secure, and I'm pleased to have just 30 minutes to make you all zero trust experts. So by show of hands, how many people think they have a good handle on what zero trust is? Raise your hand if you say, hey, I, I know zero trust. I'm sleeping through your presentation. That's good. Not many hands went up. So be assured, by the end of this presentation, you'll be that much further a zero trust expert. So let's talk about what are the challenges. And we're talking about zero trust. We're talking about access applied to zero trust. And we'll get into that context. But if we look at challenges that at least our company is seeing, so we have about 20,000 enterprise and service provider customers worldwide. So we see a lot of what's in the market. And these are some of the siloed uh, things that we're seeing because everybody typically has pockets of access control. So typically visibility. So I have a question, question for you, sir. So what would you say, what percent of endpoints on a corporate network do you think enterprises are unaware of? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, take a guess. 40. 40, that's a good guess. You win a prize, first prize of the day. In actuality, up to 30% of devices are unknown, unmanaged, or unclassified on corporate networks. So if some of you have a corporate network where it's really small, you know, 100, 200, 300, maybe 150 users, may not be a big incident, big problem. Maybe it's a manageable exposure. But if you're a fairly large organization, uh, we have companies that have a million end use, uh, million uh, uh, endpoint devices and hundreds of hundreds of thousands of users. That's a big gap to not be able to track and understand and know what's going on on your network. Another thing is uh, on the compliance side. How many people have very strict endpoint compliance po policies on what can go on the network? What's the configuration? What's running? Show of hands. Who has some really heavy heavy compliance mandates? And, and you probably, not everybody does because you have to balance that, right? You have to balance user productivity with endpoint compliance. But we are seeing a massive increase in malware, unauthorized access. And so if you're not doing enough controls or if you don't have adaptive control depending on the user and the device, including IoT devices, then that's where exposures start to mount. Uh, user experience, we just said about that balance. And one of the biggest problems with having multiple passwords, multiple access policies, and not invoking things like single sign-on or multi-factor authentication, is that you get folks who are frustrated. So they try to circumvent controls. They go up to the IT person and say, hey, by the way, can you just extend my password change for another two years? Because I'm not, I don't really want to have to remember yet another one. And last but not least uh, is scalability and reliability. So we have some pretty decent sized organizations and you'd be amazed that one division is using, for example, a UTM box or a, another box, another division where corporate is using their corporate firewall for secure access. Another division that they acquired is using a completely different thing. So there's pockets of controls, but there's no unified orchestration of those controls. There's no baseline, there's no end-to-end -end audit. And this is what we're seeing when you have more siloed access control in an organization. So what does that equate to? What it equates to is mounting access security threats. So I mentioned malware, um, but there's a lot of unauthorized device use. So show of hands, how many people have identified, at least within the last two years, an author unauthorized Wi-Fi access point on their, uh, on their network, unauthorized? That's pretty good, that's about, that's a small percent. Um, and again, depending on what access control technology you have, you'd be, probably be able to identify more. But now you're gonna have personal Wi-Fi, uh, you're gonna have unplugged systems, exposed ports, that's just on your network. No, we're not even talking about cloud-based access as well. So mobile and web access exposure. So this was a survey conducted by IDG earlier this year 
It was a global, global survey of IT decision makers and when asked what confidence do you have to actually mitigate these access security threats, uh, only 61% had, uh, had modest to little confidence. So when you start adding up the math, you say, okay, how can I step things up and why am I not seeing my investment paid off in endpoint security tools, uh, in user training, uh, and in getting visibility and actionable controls for my security operations staff. The last one being unauthorized application resource access, including lax authorization or encryption. And that's pretty key because if you're looking now at GDPR, the new California laws, Ca Ca Canadian laws, German, all these laws for data privacy are going up. All these have certain safe harbors that require certain controls to be proven that they were in place at the time of a security incident in order to avoid notification, right? So these are all the things we have to keep aware of. And that's where zero trust has come about. So I think we all know and we've heard the term zero trust, but it sounds like, okay, well, what does that apply to? It sounds like we, haven't we been doing this for a while? So if you think about zero trust in some respects, how many people have an energy saver appliance in their house? Something that has an energy saver seal. Everybody in America should be, come on, we should all be raising our hands. We probably have a dishwasher, an air conditioner, right? But they're all different categories of products, but they meet certain tenets or standards to be called energy saver. And that is what zero trust is. Although certainly different categories are just leveraging the term, zero trust for sure has very good applicability to secure access. So it used to be that, hey, we trusted everything inside our network and everything outside the network, we need to have much better trust and controls, right? But certainly we've been seeing plenty of breaches and these are, not, these are certainly companies that have the wherewithal to have pretty decent internal controls and breaches are going up by all sizes. And so you're saying, okay, can we really fully trust everything in the network? Once they get past the gate, can we really say they can go anywhere? And if we segment, even if we segment our environments, and, and segmentation is a best practice, just because you're segmented doesn't mean what I'm bringing into that segment isn't vulnerable, compromised, or still unauthorized. It doesn't necessarily mean that because I've segmented my environment that someone with privilege access or third party access uh, can't make a mistake, or worse yet, do something malicious. So in a sense, the inside of the network should no longer be trusted like the outside of the network. It should be one the same. So we're talking about least privilege controls being applied to any user device, service, and infrastructure in a given transaction. So that's what zero trust is all about. So zero trust is all about continuous adaptive trust verification. And once trust is established, it doesn't just end with the start but it, it actually continues as any transactions go on. And that's where organizations that we've seen are stepping up to. That's why there's a lot of buzz in the environment. It's not like zero trust term hasn't been around. It's the least, priv least privileged access and zero trust has been around out of the government for quite some time, certainly pre-Snowden. And zero trust certainly was introduced uh, out of Forrester quite a few years ago. But the real reason why it's resurfacing and now technologies are being applied to it is because the current modes of siloed controls and lack of orchestration have had an impact in terms of lack of visibility, lack of responsiveness. So what does zero trust access mean? So these are the, these are the key tenets, if you will, of zero trust. One is to verify the user. So it's all about user authorization. So we're talking about not who is the user, Proven identity, what is their role? Then we're talking about verifying the device. It's not just the type of the device they're using. Is it corporate issued or is it personal? What are the settings of that device? Where are they accessing the device in terms of location? What's the security posture of the device? Should certain things be running? For example, should antivirus automatically be running? Should the personal firewall automatically be activated? So I have another question for a fabulous prize. Let's see, how about you, ma'am? So let me ask you, not a trick question, you ready? 
So if if I have an endpoint agent, a management agent, let's say let's just call it McAfee EPO, it could be some ad text. If I have an agent running on a system, can I be assured when that system connects to the cloud or when it goes on like Microsoft Office uh, 365 or if it connects on a network, can I be assured that it's a secured managed device? Of course you can. Oh, I'll still give you the prize. Oh, of course you can. Well, then you definitely earn the surprise. That's right. You can't be assured. So there's a couple reasons why. First of all, if you're just using Microsoft Office security, it has pretty modest identity control. <coughs> And it just is securing your connection to the device. It's not doing endpoint inspection. It doesn't have higher levels of controls or continuous control. It's basically a very quick and simple way to get a connection. If I have an endpoint, if, if I talk about an agent, agent typically operates on a client server environment, right? If the server doesn't know the client, if the client's inactive, installed but not active, if the client is basically not there, or if it is there but no longer communicates, the management side has no idea. It only knows the last time it accessed. So a lot of times people have made investment in endpoint security controls, but there's no other secondary control to see whether those controls are active. And that also, by the way, kills one of your safe harbors. If you don't know that that endpoint device, for example, if I don't know that my smartphone actually was running MDM and segregating personal and corporate data when that device was lost or stolen, I can't have assurance to say that that device actually encrypted and protected the data on that device. So that's why device verification is pretty key. Host inspection that's native is very key and can you do that enterprise-wide. Access control, I think we all know about. It should be centrally managed. Easier said than done when you have those pockets of control. Uh, it should be granular. More importantly, it should be stateful, stateful authorization. So another trick question. Who can I get today? Who's not paying attention? I get, oh, damn, it just looked up. Okay, real quick. So, if you log in to your health, to your HR application, and you check your, you check your, um, uh, check how many vacation days you are, because I know you like, like a lot of vacations, and now, and now you then go into the system, you're now the administrator, right? And you're now doing the backend database, do all access control systems allow you to now ratchet up your degrees of authentication and automatically would do an additional level set of endpoint inspection as you're lo already logged into a network or, or a cloud application? So do you think you actually can increase dynamically, increase the control because now you're not just logging as an end user, but you're now also as an administrator? Good answer. Actually, the answer is relative. Some do, some don't. From the companies that we've, we've interacted with, a lot don't. So you absolutely want to dynamically change and have a granular policy that's conditional access that says, hey, if I've logged in now, I may, I may have them check multiple factors again or have them re-log in dynamically if they're going to an application. More importantly, I may force them to use a VPN, certain VPN connections to go to certain applications or other applications. I don't have to let the end user knows that, know that, but I need to make sure my policy is that. And the last but not least, data protection, data in transit. In certain applications, data at rest. Segregating resources and environments and applications. And also being able to do end-to-end -end audit. So these are the basic four tenants if you want to ratchet up and have a foundational model for zero, for zero, uh, zero trust access. The other key misnomer, and we get this all the time, someone comes to, we're exhibiting, someone comes to our, our desk and says, hey, I'm interested in zero trust. Do you have, does your product solve for zero trust? Of course we're a vendor, we say yes, but the reality is no one product has an answer for zero trust. Zero trust is a model there are architectures that support zero trust, and typically there's products that orchestrate, that you need to orchestrate to get a zero trust control. So for example, I think we all know all these, all these uh, three letter words. Uh, so VPN, uh, show of hands, how many people think VPN's technology is going out? It's old school, you don't need VPNs anymore. Okay, a few, a few confused hands went up.
98% of you said, no, VPNs aren't going out. It would be the same question as I said, how many people believe the perimeter's going completely away and you'll never need to have a firewall anymore? Of course. Your environments are changing, your controls are changing, but there's certain foundational controls that you're going to need in place. So MFA, multiple, multiple, multi-factor authentication, very key for, for authenticated access control. Single sign-on, definitely key. I'm still amazed that people haven't invoked this, especially with cloud access, to minimize the number of recurrent uh, logins, just no matter what app you go to. Mobile device management, or at least those that have containerization technology, so you can segregate personal and, and private data and corporate data. Uh, network access control. So here's another, here's another question. Let's see, let's get someone way in the back. You ready? You can feel this? Okay, so how popular or mainstream is network access control today? Do you think it's still nascent? People have problems with it? Is it 25%, 30%? Is it more mainstream? What, what's your guess? 15%. That's a pretty good guess. You'd be wrong, though. <laughs> it's actually mainstream. If you look at the major analysts like Gartner, it's over the trial of disillusionment. It's growing at about 20% growth rate. It's now starting to push down into smaller organizations because the NAC technology has actually tried to get simpler. In fact, some are adaptive where they use traditional 802.1x controls, which require a supplicant which is the extreme case of zero trust. It's not gonna allow you at all on a network unless you're a known managed device. And some are just more of uh, post-connection assessment, uh, which again, has degrees of control. For example, maybe I have a payment processing environment, and for PCI, I don't want anything in that environment unless I know about it. And so I can do an 802.1x control, but certainly I don't need that for guest networking per se. I don't need that because they're guests. Or maybe I want to make sure that any IoT device that comes on my network automatically goes to a segmented part of my environment until it's approved and classified. For that, you would want 802.1x, but automatically to say, hey, for these unknown devices, I'm going to put them into a classification network, or I may ask for automated means to get approvals. Maybe it gets approval by a non-IT person. Maybe it's a line of business person, for example. And the last one is software-defined perimeter. A lot of different terms for this, zero trust access, zero trust network access. How many people have heard of the term SDP, software-defined perimeter? A little more? All right. So that's the new kid on the block. So SDP is the new kid on the block. It's mostly, uh, it's been mostly geared for access to cloud applications and cloud resources as opposed to a full hybrid IT environment. The world right now is about 85% hybrid IT. There's only about 15% of, of IT environments that are pure, complete public and private cloud. If you're a really small company, you certainly can run cloud, but most organizations have a mix. So SDP really extends the zero trust model. So the key tenets of zero trust, no inside and outside distinction, full authentication before and during a transaction. Certainly policy-based control. We talked about knowing who it is, what role they have, what's, how the device is configured, what's the security state. So a lot of tools, a lot of secure access tools, for example, have UEBA built into their system so they know, hey, you're accessing from China, you're accessing from the US simultaneously. Why is this happening? You're, you're accessing from more than four devices. You only typically do two devices. You're an administrator, and these have to be corporate-issued devices. I'm cutting you out or I'm at least notifying someone or segregating you. Uh, so granular segment uh, and then obviously trust established closest to the source. That means trust established closest to the user and their device and to the application that's being served, whether it's cloud or in the data center. So SDP takes it a bit further and where it takes it further is that it's an architecture. So if you buy an SDP solution, it's not like you're getting zero trust, but you're, again, it's another solution towards a zero trust model. So what's neat about and different about SDP, it has some attributes, even a VPN. A VPN could be a zero trust solution, but it does something a little different. It separates data and control planes. So another trick question. Let's see if you know the answer. So if I'm a VPN, 
Does all my data and all my controls go through the VPN? Or does it go separately? Depends on the configuration. That was the correct answer. Uh, you're a ventriloquist, aren't you? So the correct answer is it depends on the configuration, right? So most VPN, modern VPNs have split tunneling. So it can send some control information back to the network for the VPN to process. And some, and some uh, once granted, it sends the data maybe to the application. So you can do split tunneling today with a VPN. Uh, and not all controls go through a VPN. Some organizations want everything, controls and data, to go through a VPN and through the network for compliance reasons, for data inspection reasons. So, there, so it depends on how you configure it. It depends on the policy. It depends on your business needs. What's interesting about SDP is it always separates the data and control environment. So that means that you can, it has some scalability. It has some provisioning benefit. Uh, it makes it easier to provision. So the controller understands the infrastructure of applications. The controller holds the policies. Once a trust is established, now that its connection is directly between the user and their device and the application. And then because of this, because a particular user or device will only be able to see what's authorized to see, that reduces your threat surface. But again, it's a new architecture, it's one piece, and in fact, if you're like most organizations with a hybrid IT environment, you'll need to bring up SDP as a yet another access control, as well as keep your VPN and, and your network gen firewall so it's not a dump one for the other, it's a all-inclusive thing for your controls. So this is how it works. So I described it briefly, but basically, because you all want to leave here secure ac access experts, right? Everybody just raised their hand, it's amazing, yes. So Software Divine Network, basically I have a controller, it has my policies, it understands users, it understands devices, it understands my network infrastructure. I have gateways closest to the applications, that's what the controller communicates to. I, have, I can have a client, it could be agent or agent list, could be just browser based. That's with the end user. And essentially the end user is just going to make a request to the controller. The controller is then going to talk to the client and say, okay, let's activate your controls and who are you, what do you have, what's your security posture, what are you requesting. It'll send then a list of things it could go after, you know, applications it could access to. Once it's selected, the controller will then communicate to the gateway and say, hey, you're about to receive a certain mechanism of communication, a trusted communication from this entity to you, and I'm going to permit that to happen and tell you how that control is going to be uh, exchanged. So that's, that's the control information. Then it's going to tell the client, and it's going to tell the uh, gateway to say, okay, communicate. And now trusted data communication is established between the client and the application or the controller. So in this case, we separated the data and control plane. And then we said, hey, this should be continuous and adaptive, which means that periodically the controller should go back to the client, even while it's having sessions, and it says, hey, has any of the security state changed? If it has, it should change the communication, or had something stopped, change the communication. What it also means is that the SDP controller can, is basically a per session, per app implementation. That's not necessarily un unique, because you can have always on VPN, per app VPN, uh, so you can get the same zero trust controls out of a traditional VPN, but it has a lot of benefits in terms of reducing uh, the attack surface and separating data plane from control plane, and also has some benefits for provision, because it's easier to com for an administrator to provision through the controller users to applications. So some of the use cases, biggest use case, simplified access. Now keep in mind, modern VPNs have simplified access too. But this typically can put up a web browser, it can, it can just operate in the background. So simplified user experience and BYOD, Third-party privilege, privileged access. Uh, we talked about per-app network segmentation. Again, since if I'm a on a device and I'm in the network, I won't be able to move laterally. I won't be able to see things unless I have talking to that controller have permission to do so. So it does reduce the attack surface. It also reduces some of the uh, things that are internet exposed. 
And last but not least, in a very dynamic DevOps environment, you get much faster and easier provision, provisioning uh, for leveraging SDP than you traditionally would with uh, VPN. So there are some good benefits for SDP. So I'm going to give a little plug and tell you a little bit about, about Pulse Secure. How many, how many folks here are Pulse Secure customers? Few? OK, a few, a few handfuls. So, so Pulse Secure, we're actually a spin-off, a carve-out of Juniper Networks five years ago. So we had two big divisions, a security divisions went on our own, built out solutions. And so today we operate uh, on 80% of the Fortune 500, about over 20,000 endpoints under protection, uh, 22, 22 million endpoints, 22,000 customers. So chances are if you flew here, uh, chances are if you bought something online, chances are if you did a, a social media tweet, chances are uh, maybe you got pulled over by certain police. We probably touched you at least a few times in your life, you know, every year of your life, you're touching Pulse, some aspect of Pulse Secure technology. Um, and we are definitely a market leader in zero trust access. So to give you an idea of our portfolio, so we talked about how not one product itself makes zero trust. So the challenge isn't, hey, I have multiple products, don't I have zero trust? It's how do you orchestrate that? How do you set one set of controls and policies that apply to different types of devices, including native IoT and Android, uh, Android and iOS devices? Uh, how do I apply different levels of controls depending on where they are? Uh, in terms of where they are in the country, in terms of whether you're using it multiple distributed data centers or simultaneously in public or private cloud environments. Uh, how do you orchestrate this all together? So we have a, a solution set that covers VPN and cloud access, software-defined perimeter, uh, endpoint, endpoint protection with Pulse Workspace, uh, application protection delivery with VADC, uh, a certain next-gen net network access control solution that also does IoT visibility and control, then last but not least, it's all centrally managed Pulse One. So that's our solution set, and the whole idea is to facilitate orchestration. So some of our solutions you buy in by themselves, or you can actually replace others and get centralized control. So a single client, agent and agent list. What's really interesting is it encompasses both architectures, both a traditional VPN, for example, and a network access control, and an SDP architecture. It's all rolled into one and integrated, uh, which makes it really easy to orchestrate controls, but more so it's designed for interoperability. So it can be deployed on your existing infrastructure. So this, just to give you an idea of where things sit, and this could be, by the way, a traditional um, VPN, a traditional VPN application. So you'd have your client, you'd have centralized management, You'd have your VPN, your Pulse Connect Secure, and your VPN, again, can do split tunneling, so you can do web apps. You'd have your network access control solution, Pulse Policy Secure, inside your network. All these things can be orchestrated with common policy, centralized auditing. So you might say, well, you just talked to us about SDP and how it extends zero trust access policy. And I also said, don't forget, most companies work in a hybrid IT environment. Not everything is just pure cloud. Not a lot of legacy apps are going to instantly go to the cloud. It's probably going to be a three to five or more year journey. So how do you accomplish that? So one way to accomplish that, as I mentioned before, is OK, I'm now going to buy another siloed application, another standalone FTP solution, maybe one that operates as a service, and fold that into the mix. I have another set of policies and restrictions to apply. or with our case, all, our entire environment is completely SDP enabled. So with a license key, you get the best of all the, all the architectures all orchestrated together, which is different on the market today. So some of the value for hybrid IT approach for secure access is you have a single plane of glass for visibility and management. It works, again, cloud or on-premise, much faster deployment, more flexible deployment. So we talk to a lot of companies, and again, doing this for so many years, you do a lot, of, a lot of quick fixes, turnarounds, you have a lot of unique use cases. You do this enough, and you've seen a lot of use cases, so we have a lot, of, a lot less Band-Aids. Most of our products are pretty adaptable, uh, where you don't have to do application wrapping or other mechanisms to try to make something work. And again, we work with the customer's existing infrastructure. 
better user experience. It's not just user experience for the end user, but it's a user experience for the administrator because they have to take the brunt of putting all these policies and operationalizing everything and then maintaining it. Then last but not least, enhanced application protection. So the last thing I'll leave you with on Pulse Secure, yeah, with us you get the best of both worlds. So you get pretty strong, diverse, secure access capabilities now in Zero Trust implemented and expanded as you need it. That works with your environment. Uh, certainly we've been around, been there and done that. We work with all sizes of organizations from a million end users to a hundred end users. Uh, it's ex we offer extensive authentication. So you might say, hey, well, I've already made an investment in things like Duo, or I have a Cisco infrastructure, or I'm using some other, uh, I'm using RSA tokens. We work with it all, all integrated under one policy, centralized management. And last but not least, uh, it's hybrid cloud enabled. So no matter where you are on that hybrid cloud journey, uh, our solutions adapt to the needs.